So let's take a look at what you need to do hollow chisel mortising on your Shopsmith Mark V. Uh, first off, you need to have these components right here, which were sold as part of a hollow chisel mortising kit. This is going to straddle your drill chuck attached to the end of your quill, the same place where your, your saw guard attaches. And this is going to hold the, uh, the chisel. The chisel is held stationary. The chisel does not spin. But this is going to transfer our downward force to the chisel. This is a hold down. Now, the hold down is almost a misnomer. It's not a springy hold down. It doesn't push the wood down onto the table. But as we retract the chisel out of the wood, this will help to hold the, uh, the, the wood on the table. We'll see how that goes on in just a moment. But the most interesting part about this whole setup are these hollow chisels. You'll notice that they have a drill bit inside of them. Pull that drill bit out. And then it is a square chisel. On the side here is a place where the chips are ejected, and they're ejected by the flutes on the drill bit. Now, this is an old-style hollow chisel uh, that was sold by Shopsmith, made by Forest City Tools here in High Point, or uh, here, in, here in North Carolina. And um, it has two flutes and two sharp edges. And the setup for this is perhaps a little different than the setup that we would use this style of hollow chisel and bit is referred to as a Japanese style. Um, and, and this is the kind that's used today for pretty much everybody's hollow chisel mortisers, whether you're buying one even from Harbor Freight or Grizzly on up to Delta, Powermatic, and so on. They're using this style. And part of what's different about these is they realize that once the hole is chopped square, you don't need any of the rest of this chisel to be causing friction or interfering. And so they just hollow grind that material away. Uh, you'll also notice that the ejection slot begins much sooner, and that way it can get rid of the chips sooner. Chips in the, the body of that chisel are just getting hot and that heat can damage the temper of our, uh, our bit. Also, you'll notice that this style of drill bit has a single flute. So it's a pretty coarse flute that allows it to carry the chips out a little easier. And as a result, it has just one cutting edge, one lifting surface right there, pretty su substantial uh, tip on it, and it has one little outrigger that's going to score the outside. The way we set these up, I believe, is a little different than the way we used to do it with these. And that is, when you when you set this in the machine, you pull it tight to the chisel, and then you push the bit out just a little bit, just enough to prevent that surface right there from rubbing against the chisel. All that would do is create heat, possibly even trapping chips. With this style of, of uh, bit, I actually like to have that flat lifting surface almost level with the tips. So I'll, I'll have it just below the tip. And uh, that way it is drilling the hole and that's doing most of the work. And then immediately the chisels begin lifting the wood out. Uh, we'll see this in the setup, but I just did want to show you the difference between these two. I prefer this style of chisel and bit. This is also the style that's now available from Shopsmith. Now, to maintain these, and, and unfortunately, when they're brand new, they're typically not sharp, you need two different methods of sharpening. The first one is pretty easy. You can buy a cone-shaped stone. This one is a, a diamond stone. I have that in two different grits. The one I have back at my shop is actually made of stone. And uh, all we're going to do with this is we're going to rotate that in there, and as long as it gets out to the edges it'll sharpen this. Um, if it does need to be ground, if it's a bad shape, and maybe this stone is a slightly different angle than the, the stone that was originally used, you then use the coarse one to, to reshape this. Turns out that the angle's not so critical. What is critical is when we sharpen it, that it's sharpened all the way out to those edges. Now, whether you do that with a hand drill or even in a drill press, I used to have a wooden block that I would drill a 5 8 inch hole, set this in it, and then in the drill press, I would sharpen that. Now I just do this by hand. 
with a, uh, a cordless drill. When you do sharpen this, you'll know it's sharp because you will raise a burr. There's a little wire edge right there. And I want to I want to have a burr on all parts of that edge. And that tells me that this cone got to all parts of that edge. And then I need to remove that burr using a flat stone. And now what we're not after here is we, we are not wanting to change the size of this in any way. So we're really just honing off those little burrs. Um, back in my shop, I, I have leather straps, I have uh, water stones, things like that. I didn't have any of those here, so I, I just went ahead and jumped on Amazon and bought a couple diamond stones. This has got a coarse and a fine side. And uh, basically what we're going to do here is just lay the chisel flat and pull it back like that. And all we're trying to do is remove that burr and polish that, that edge just a bit. Don't raise this up. Don't, don't do that because we don't want to damage those sharp points that we have. And I also don't go forward on it because I think it's possible that I could roll that edge back in on itself. Yes, you could do circles, you could do figure eights, lots of ways to do it. I just like to do it like I'm stropping. And we do that until the burr is gone and the surface is a little bit shiny. So that one's ready to use now. But I don't want to use that one because it's got the old fashioned style. One thing to point out to you though, is because this drill bit is a different length than this uh, other Japanese style that I purchased, um, I have to configure this a little bit different than the way it was uh, instructed by Shopsmith. So here's how you would sharpen this. Um, this one, I need to change the shape on a little bit to match my stone. So I'm just going to put that in there, spin it gently, apply a little bit of pressure against it. We could put a drop of, uh, of oil on that to keep, keep it from getting too hot, losing its temper. I will also reverse the drill every now and again, just to keep everything even. And this is the core stone. All right. Another thing that can be done is you can relieve the inside corners here, either with a V-shaped file or a stone. And uh, just by by filing down right here, you would give yourself a little bit more uh, room for the chips to fly by. Um, I'm not going to do that today, but that's something I might do if I were chopping a bunch of mortises. I also will lubricate the inside of this. I will lubricate the flute here. Um, I, I, I use a dry lube that even if it were to transfer to the wood, it wouldn't interfere later with glue. I started to put things away and forgot I was gonna show you this. Um, I, I went out and just got some PVC pipe and some caps, glued the cap on one end, and I leave the cap loose on the other. And this is how I store my chisels and bits to keep them from rusting here in the humid air of North Carolina. When I put them back in, I always make sure to put them in tip first so that they don't surprise me on their way back out. Before we raise our Mark V up into the drill press position, we need to think about something. We're gonna be putting a ton of pressure on that table when mortising. And that pressure is possibly going to cause our carriage here to slip. Right now, I have it loose. Um, so. Depending on your height, maybe you're comfortable with just going ahead and putting your carriage all the way at the bottom so there's nowhere for it to slip. Um, I've determined that uh, I like to have it up about six to eight inches from the bottom. And if I were mortising on this all the time, I think I would make myself a spacer specifically to hold that space and not put all the pressure on the lock. I like this carriage lock exactly how I have it set. If you need to add some tension to it, you can take a wrench and tighten it on the back side there. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a spacer and I got a little bit two-sided tape for now. <clears throat> and I'm just gonna hold that here against the base, slide the carriage against it, and then lock it in place. So that's gonna give me, of course, the locking of the carriage, but that'll back that up and make sure it doesn't slip anywhere. 
that's something that, like I say, I would probably make myself a little fitting that would maybe sandwich this, put a couple rare earth magnets on it to hold it in place, because who doesn't need more rare earth magnets in their life? So let's uh, go up into the drill press position. Carriage, make sure the headstock is locked. And here we go. Now you notice because it is a 520, I have these tubes here. I have those installed because I'm going to put legs on here to support even the outfeed side of the table. But we won't mess around with that just yet. Now here's the point where somebody's going to say, he didn't lock the drill press lock. That's right. I addressed that in a video. I'll link to it below. So you may have seen a recent video where I replaced the stock quill lever with these two levers. I'm going to use these in just a bit, but I want you to see the difference between the stock handle and these handles. So uh, we'll, we'll put this one over here for now, and I'm going to set this one on the floor. Um, next thing I'm going to install typically is I'll go ahead and put the hold down in place. Now, depending upon what version of the Mark V you have, this hold down will either have this T-nut that fits into the T-slot on the top of the 510 and the 520 fence. If you have a Model 500 or an earlier model, yours will not have this T-nut. Now, if you buy one today, it will come with the T-nut, but you don't use it if you have one of those earlier machines. Also, you thread that T-nut on and you have a washer over it. I've seen this installed before without the washer, and what happens is the tip of that passes through the T-nut and buries itself into the aluminum fence. It's not supposed to do that. Instead, what we're hoping to do is to clamp that T-slot between the washer and the T-nut. So the washer that comes with it has one perfectly flat with slight round over sides, and the other side might have a burr. I always make sure the burr side is up because I don't want that burr touching the, uh, the fence at all. So we'll just screw that on, put, put it on there loosely, and then this is going to slide onto that aluminum extrusion. The opening of this in the middle aligns with where our chuck's going to wind up, and um, <clears throat> It's, it's a little bit off center of the post itself. And uh, we need to tighten that down. Let me show you how we tighten it. We loosen the hold down and then this turns. And to get it fully tight, you put your 5 32nd wrench into it and twist it and that'll clamp it down. So all that is happening here behind the chuck where maybe you can't see it. There we go. And then we'll adjust the height on this when we're ready for that. Right now, I'll just tighten that down and maybe move the fence back a little bit. Now, one challenge that we have with this off-the-shelf uh, chisel and bit set is that bit is not as long as the standard Shopsmith one. Um, I'm assuming that the brand new Shopsmith one that has the Japanese style, that that is designed to the proper length. But when I install this all together, um, I, I have trouble getting it to where my chuck can actually grab it. It's, it's pretty tight, uh, pretty tight fit. So I'm finding that my older Shopsmith Jacobs style uh, chuck works better than the, um, the later model uh, Shopsmith chuck. Also, another advantage of this one is it slips through that yoke where this style of shopsmith chuck does not fit through that yoke, right? So we're going to use the older style Jacob's chuck. And we're going to make sure that that ends up on a flat or on the flat that aligns with that set screw right there in that knurled collar. And we want to make sure that there is no space between these two. If, uh, if that were to move on us, that could po possibly 
cause our drill bit to run up into our uh, chisel and that could cause problems. The yoke here, when it goes on, um, it really doesn't matter which way it faces uh, from a standpoint of how it's going to work. It can face any direction you like, but uh, I think traditionally it's put in front just to kind of protect you from, from getting into that, uh, that chuck. I don't know that that's ever really a problem. And by the way, this is a 3 16 wrench that we're using to tighten this. And we want to go ahead and use the L shape to get that tight. Next, with, uh, with this part right here, um, and because of the size of all these, I end up having to have this higher up than I do with the, uh, the Shopsmith chisel and bit set. So I'm going to drive this all the way on and tighten that set screw right there. And when that set screw is tight, that is now below the surface. I'm gonna then slide both of these up in, and I don't wanna go all the way till I'm bottomed out, but close, close to being totally bottomed out. And we'll, we'll lock that. Now that's holding the, the chisel in place, not the bit. The, uh, the distance for this chisel then is, as I mentioned, I want that lifter surface, the flat surface, to be almost flush with those tips. So I'm just going to hold that in place and, uh, and tighten my chuck. Now you've probably heard this and it's true. Go ahead and tighten all three points. I remember thinking that was a bunch of garbage and uh, I had an engineer friend tell me, look, if you don't believe me, try it. Tighten all three points for the next 10 times you tighten. And uh, so the next 10 times I tightened, I went one, two, three, it didn't do anything. But finally on one of those attempts, that third tightening actually did something. And, and what it'll tell you also is if your bit is perfectly centered in the chuck. So it's a good habit to get into. So right now I've got a, 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 the proper clearance down here below. You've probably seen videos that talk about using a dime to get this spacing. And basically what they'll tell you to do is when you install the chisel, put a dime at the top, slide the chisel in, leaving a gap then of a dime you then slide your bit all the way up till it bottoms out, tightening it in place. Then you remove the dime and move the chisel up. I find that's true with the old Shopsmith chisels that is not quite, it doesn't give me quite enough space that I need with the Japanese style chisels. And so I, I just use that, making sure that the, uh, the lifting, lifting surface here is extended uh, a little bit further down. So now to check if my chisel is in square. I'm going to extend the quill here and lock it in place and bring my fence forward. And it does tell me I need to rotate this just a smidgen to get everything square. And now we're looking good. So I almost forgot we've got to install these telescopic legs. You don't have to, but it's wise to. These attach again using the Shopsmith toolbox, and we'll just extend those down there and do the same over on this side. I'm going to set this to where we're not going quite through the table, and let's get that quill handle in the right position. So let's let's try a couple of these with uh, the standard. Will handle. I just can't do it. Just can't do it. So 
let's take this off, put that hub back on here, and we'll use my new multi-spoke handle. Hey, <laughs> we forgot to adjust our hold down. <sighs> Try that again. Man, that's awesome to have a second set of handles or a second handle. So there are a lot of videos here on YouTube that show you how to use a hollow chisel mortiser, more techniques. Um, I, I'll admit to you, uh, here's a picture of my hollow chisel mortiser from my shop. Uh, years ago, I decided that I wanted to have a dedicated hollow chisel mortiser that had lots of mm behind it. So I bought a Powermatic stand model, and uh, that thing will, will cut three-quarter inch mortises in a single bound. I mean, it's, it's a, incredible how powerful that is. Um, I, I used to not ever recommend the hollow chisel mortiser for the shopsmith because of the old style of chisels and bits that the shopsmith sold. But a uh, number of years ago, they switched to this new Japanese style whether they're made in China, Taiwan, I don't know, but the style of that chisel and bit makes all the difference in the world. Get yourself a diamond hone, the cone shape, get yourself a diamond hone for the outside to knock off the burr, and I still very seriously recommend that you check out uh, Jeffrey Baker's website and consider getting yourself some of these handles. Now, one question that did come up was, is it, is it possible that you could damage the, uh, the pinion, there's a rack and pinion, if you will, the rack being machined in the back of the quill and the pinion being on that uh, shaft right there. Um, yeah, of course you could. Um, you know, Shopsmith has had this machine for hollow chisel mortising since the 1950s. And the pressure it takes to push that chisel through the wood is the pressure it's always taken to push the chisel through the wood. Um, so I would contend that uh, it, it, I remember years ago doing repair, it was really, really rare that we ever saw any damage to that pinion. And if it does get damaged, it can be replaced like pretty much everything else on this machine. So um, I don't know. I think uh, if you want to do square mortises, it's something worth considering. Um, I, I also do them with Forstner bits. I also do them with router bits and so on. Biggest advantage of this is I can do much greater depth than I can with a drill bit or a router bit. And um, I don't know, it's worth considering. So that's it. I'll see you in the midweek episode of Stumped Q&A to uh, address your questions and comments and cheap shots. And uh, we'll see how it goes. Make it a great week.